don't forget the um, multiple choice part of lecture exam five is uh, available after this afternoon. And it's on Optorio. And we're going to take advantage and start the next unit, which is um, the respiratory system. picture of the system, of the anatomy, the main function is gas exchange. It ventilates the lungs. see the lungs there. What you can see are the microscopic air sacs called the alveolar spaces. Alveolar spaces. It ventilates the lungs, the alveolar spaces, with fresh air. and uses the circulatory system for long distance transport of oxygen and CO2. study. Uh, so one of these words I used, uh, ventilation. It ventilates. Ventilation is breathing. And breathing is, is a two-step process. You breathe in, you breathe out. We call that inspiration, expiration. to breathe in and then breathe out is because this system is a dead end. It's not a circuit like the circulatory system. Blood goes round and round, right? Arteries, capillaries, veins, back to the heart. But the respiratory tract is a dead end. It ends with the alveolar spaces. You can bring the air in, then you got to bring the air back out and then kind of resupply. Um, and so we can kind of start to look at the anatomy here. Um, the structures that you have to ventilate air through. So very simply, you have the upper respiratory tract, these anatomy structures. The upper respiratory tract. You can relate, like if you've been sick, if you've had a cold or sore throat. Maybe you're congested in those areas. It's the anatomy structures in what's called the upper respiratory tract, which includes, like on the picture shows, the nasal cavities. Your throat, which is the pharynx, Just inferior to that, your voice box, which is called the larynx in your anterior neck.
And uh, most anatomists consider the larynx between, to be the border between upper and lower respiratory tract. So larynx is the border. And inferior to that, you have all these other airways that you ventilate air through. with the anatomy structure that you ventilate air through. You can call it the lower respiratory tract. Inferior to the larynx in your neck is the trachea, right there. Trachea runs down in, from your neck into your chest in the media in the mediastinum. So the trachea is your one airway which will divide and divide and divide and divide. And they divide into all these airways called bronchi. Bronchi is plural for bronchus. There's all these branchings and branchings of these airways. And uh, the smallest airways that conduct air are called the bronchioles, kind of like arterioles are the smallest arteries. Bronchioles are the smallest of the bronchi, of the bronchi. And there are structural differences as you move along. To start, the larger airways, there's fewer of them, but the diameter is larger. They they have cartilage, like hyaline cartilage. And cartilage is stiff. These contain cartilage. Cartilage is stiff. It helps keep the airways patent, which means open. So that as you suck air through them, it doesn't collapse. Like if you're trying to suck liquid through a paper straw, the paper straw will collapse. Um, plastic straws of or worse for the environment, but they're stiff. They stay, they keep the straw open. Kind of like same one with airways. So the bronchioles, they're the smallest airways. Um, they don't have cartilage. They have smooth muscle. Got smooth muscle, you can be modified by the ANS, the autonomic nervous system. <clears throat> so those are the airways that you can control by dilating or constricting. And so we kind of call that bronchoconstriction or bronchodilation. So um, ANS. The sympathetic response is to dilate the airways to reduce the re resistance to airflow, get more air to the lungs. And it's the parasympathetic is the bronchoconstrict. Not to the point of where you're restricting airflow, but just you're not as dilated as you are when you're in a fight or flight response is the thing. So, um, you know, the bronchioles, the smallest airways are like the alveolar ducts, alveolar um, spaces, okay? Sometimes they're called alveolar sacs. And in individual airspace, you can just call and alveolus. Now, and I'll show you pictures of all this stuff because past trachea, you can see the first division of your airways into your lungs. You have a right and left lung. But after that, that first division right here, the airways disappear into the lungs and under, undergo 
23 or 24 branchings, okay, into these smaller and smaller and smaller airways. So that's really what I got, got to go through. Here in this picture, you can kind of see upper, you can see trachea, um, you can see the lungs. You can't see the airways in the lungs. You can see how the lungs are kind of stuck to the chest wall here. And you can see how inferiorly the lungs are kind of attached to the diaphragm there. And your diaphragm's um, considered a breathe, breathing muscle. I'll, I'll, I'll show you the mechanics of breathing in another lecture. For now, I just kind of wanted to show you how it's a dead end. The last structure I listed is the dead end. That's ultimately where the fresh air needs to go. Okay. At the um, alveolar spaces, the alveoli there, they interact with pulmonary capillaries. So these structures here, <coughs> surrounded by the pulmonary capillaries. Because, like I said, I erased it. The main function is gas exchange, and this is where it would occur when you bring the fresh air to the pulmonary blood. Okay, so that's where you can accomplish the gas exchange. And another thing I want to mention now is this system, the lung tissue, these alveolar spaces interacting with the pulmonary capillaries, they provide a lot of area, a lot of surface area for gas exchange. So I'll put that as a note here. Provide lots of surface area for gas exchange. We'll look at it all. When we get there, you'll see that if you're going to have molecules of gas diffuse across the al alveolus into the blood, that membrane between them ha has to be very thin. It's called the respiratory membrane. And um, that's the thing that there's a lot of surface area. They like to use centimeters squared as the units. So a lot of surface area provided by, on the right here, respiratory membrane. We'll look at the anatomy of that membrane because it's where the gases are exchanged deep inside the lung tissue. So I think it's good to like start teaching what the airway is, literally, starting with the upper respiratory tract. <coughs> then we'll get into the lower respiratory tract. The lower respiratory tract, your airway is deep in the lung tissue. Like if you ever had um, Say, for example, bronchitis or pneumonia. That's kind of an infection of the lower respiratory tract. So we'll start with the upper respiratory tract. I want to show you the pharynx, but let's look at this picture first. You can breathe through your nose or your mouth, but it's more proper to breathe through your nose. We don't even teach the, mouth, the oral cavity as the airway. It's not. It's the food way. It's where you chew your food and swallow. If you're congested, you have to breathe through your mouth. And we don't like that, do we? Your mouth gets all dry. It's not made for breathing. Of course, if the airway is blocked, they use the oral cavity to intubate, right? to, to get air to you. But uh, we, we teach the airway starting with the nostril or the nose. The anatomy word for your nose is called anterior nares. So, study the airway. 
I just want to go through all the details of everything you ventilate air through all the way to the dead end, to the alveolar spaces. Start with the nose, anterior. Nares, commonly known as nostrils. And in there you got, well, you can't really see it there. <clears throat> you know where your nose is. It has hair follicles to help catch dust and debris. And when you draw the air, the fresh air, into the nasal cavities, um, there are structures in there that help slow and warm and humidify the air, like the conchi. So then you have inside the nasal cavities, right? I mean, there's, there's two of them. There's a left and a right. They're separated by the nasal septum. You learned the anatomy of that in 430. Um, there's a, so I'll just mention it. There's some cartilage in there. If, if you've forgotten the anatomy, you want to look up a couple of bones. One is the boner, as a review. And the other structure is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid that help make up the nasal septum. Anyways, hanging off the nasal septum on either side are superior, middle, inferior, conchi. So I'll list this under nasal, nasal cavities. Let's see if we put my bullet point. Here. Superior, middle, inferior, nasal conchi. You can see them on the picture, they're the little shelves hanging off. That superior, middle, inferior nasal conchi. As you ventilate air through it, it kind of gets trapped in the meatuses underneath. And that kind of like slows the airflow down as you suck air through those tiny spaces, these shelves. So um, the nasal cavities really help to um, these nasal conchies are described as turbinates. Basically, warm, slows, air, flow, basically. You draw air from the nasal cavities. To get from the nasal cavities to your throat, you exit the nasal cavities through what's called the posterior nares. You have anterior, posterior nares. Which is basically, on this figure, kind of the border between the edge of that blue region. Because that blue region is the top of your throat called the nasal pharynx. Pharynx is your throat. Now the throat, the pharynx, is divided into nasopharynx and the airway comes right after posterior nares and it's basically behind, it's posterior to the nasal cavities. slide here to look at a more anatomically detailed picture 
So I'll put these side by side. This is a nice picture of a book. It's a sagittal section of head and neck. And um, there's some lymphoid tissue in here I want you to know, the tonsils. And in this region, the nasal pharynx, there's a bit of, I'm pointing right where you should be looking, it's uh, the pharyngeal tonsil. There's also an orifice that leads to the auditory tube. It has a much longer name in the book, and it's called like the, pharyng the pharyngeal orifice to the pharyngotympanic tube. We, we can just call this the orifice right here, orifice to the auditory tube. It leads to the tympanic cavity of the middle ear. All right, there. So, uh, orifice of uh, Two. That, that, that might be one if you want to look it up if you got the ear lecture in 430. It, it's basically the tube that leads to the tympanic uh, cavity of the middle ear. Middle ear. Well, it leads there. So the throat is connected to the ear. Okay? And that's why there's ear, nose, throat specialists because if they're all connected, that's how infection can spread. All right, so the region posterior, the region of the throat posterior to the um, oral cavity is the oral pharynx. This color right there, oral pharynx. And the oral pharynx, like I said, located post Exterior to the oral cavity, your mouth. And there's a bit of a, there's a tonsil there. Right there. Um, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but there's this little mucous membrane archway called the fosses, and wedged in there is the palatine tonsil. Okay, because it's close to the palate, the soft palate. There's a, the soft palate right there, and you've got the fosses and the palatine tonsil. So note, palatine tonsil, and it's in the fosses, at F-A-U-C-E-S. The fosses are, if you look at the back of your mouth, the arch, in the back of your mouth are the fosses. So I'm trying to emphasize the tonsils here. And then inferior to the oral pharynx, it's all continuous. This region right there, right there, it's colored green there. It's the laryngopharynx. The laryngopharynx is a fork in the road, okay? Because it can lead either to the trachea, or if you go a little bit anterior, I'm sorry, it, it can either lead to the larynx trachea, or if you keep going down, it's the food way, the esophagus. So it can route air to larynx, which is the next structure of the airway, or you want to route food to the food way, the esophagus. Breathing, you want to route air to the larynx, and that's the next structure in the airway. Larynx and pharynx. So now we're inside your neck. We're out of the head, we're kind of more in the neck area. Uh, this is an interesting picture of the dissection. I haven't done this dissection yet, but I'm sorry, go ahead. Because then some people and kids don't have a problem. They have a problem that yeah. when they are eating the food, if this food goes to their airway, why they have the laryngeal pharynx is not there, or it's not developed, or what's the problem? Oh, so you're saying kids are more prone to choke? No, because some some kids are have the problem when they eat it, 
and it comes through their nose, mm -hmm. and it goes to their airways, the food and whatever liquid they are. Um, I don't know if there's a particular tendency for kids why they do that. So, but what's the question? So it is because of a little bit. Uh, it is related to that. Or I don't no? think so. Um, when you swallow food, I don't know. I come out of your nose unless you. I don't know, unless you're laying, like laying down. I, I'm not sure why it would happen. Uh, you, you can do it if you're too far off. You know, because it's very frequent. Are you talking about, you've seen this in the clinics? No, I'm talking about my own son. Okay. And it tends to come out of his nose a lot. Yes. Yeah. Because Mostly for the anatomy. When you swallow food, there's a little flap of uh, tissue here called the uh, epiglottis. It's supposed to guard the airway. When food is supposed to go down this way. Yeah. But when you swallow, um, there's a lot of muscular reactions that happen. If it backwashes, it'll go out your nose. Okay. So it's because of epiglottis? No, it should go down here. I, I don't know if there's some kind of constriction that happens when he swallows this air food when it gets closed. It's something you want to talk to your doctor about. Okay. That normally shouldn't happen. Yeah. Is it like, Every time he eats, that happens? Most of the time when he drinks. How old is he? Yeah, if he is just drinking. He is 10 years. But oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But talk about it with the pediatrician, see why that happens. Maybe there's an anatomical reason why. Yeah. This, this food weight is kind of shut off when you swallow. Yeah, you know what's cool? Look up an x-ray of barium swallow, and you'll really see everything that happens when you swallow. And uh, it's not hard to believe why it can come out your nose. Um, all right, getting back to the larynx. Any questions on, any more questions on pharynx? I'll talk about the larynx next. Um, let's see here. So looking at this, I want you to understand what you're looking at. They've cut the throat open. Now to do that, you have to disconnect the head from the cervical vertebra, okay? Because this is all in front of the cervical vertebra. There's a little ligament here, I've never done this. But if you just make that little cut, you can take the whole head and anterior neck and separate it from the cervical vertebrae. Okay. So once you've done that, we have access to the pharynx, which they just cut open here. And once you do that, you can see the larynx right there. So this kind of laryngeal inlet is how you route air into the larynx. That's what you're looking at there. So what we just looked at was the nasal uh, passages. There's the nasal septum. And these uh, turbinates, those are your conchi. There's the inferior nasal conchi. So that basically, this is the posterior nares. This is the root of the tongue. So that's the oral cavity. Okay. And so there's the pharynx there. On this picture here, um, this flap sticking up is the epiglottis. And these two bumps, are bumps or tubercles, you need to know the cuneiform and paniculate tubercles. It's responsible for voice production. We call it your voice box. And um, we'll, we'll look at the vocal cords in there. Also, during swallowing, it guards the airway so you don't choke. So this, this posterior view with the throat cut open, we can kind of see that it's covered with a mucous membrane, but it's basically a cartilaginous structure.
cartilaginous the structure covered with a mucous membrane. And we want to kind of look at the cartilage that's deep to the membrane. I said you should note the epiglottis so far. You can see in this picture. The epiglottis means above the glottis. The glottis is a, well, I'll show you later, but just note that. But this is the thing that covers the glottis to keep you from choking. covers glottis during swallowing. I'll show you swallowing more when we get to digestion, but for now it starts the airway. And those two little bumps, the cuneiform corniculate tubercles. Cuneiform tubercle. Corniculate. Okay, I want to move away from this picture and uh, let's look at the larynx in isolation. So what I did was I took a picture of a posterior view of the larynx, since that's a posterior view, and I put it side by side so you can kind of see the, the relationship. What it looks like when the larynx trachea is kind of isolated. It looks very different with just the cartilage. Here's a picture of a model that we have in the room that looks similar to that picture. We call it the tongue larynx model, shown here. What I like about this picture is that it shows partially the larynx covered with that mucous membrane, then partially the mucous membrane is gone, it's all that, that bluish cartilage color. Okay. So again, there's the root of the tongue, there's the root of the tongue. So you can kind of see how this uh, matches that figure there. There's a side view of the tongue larynx model. And here's a view of how the larynx is positioned in the anterior neck. This is a picture we used to study the carotid arteries. And I taught you before that the bifurcation of the carotid is at the superior border of the thyroid cartilage. Yeah, that's what we mean before. So we consider the larynx to be the anterior neck because it's in front of the cervical vertebra. So let's learn the, uh, the laryngeal cartilages. Notice that there's really no bones of the larynx. There is a hyoid bone that's technically not part of the larynx, but they do show it here. A hyoid bone and it's an attachment point for a lot of neck muscles, but we're focusing on the larynx here. And um, you can see that big shield-shaped thyroid cartilage. When people say, voice box, it's this. Thyroid means shield shape, and it helps resonate the sound of your voice, because the sound waves can resonate in that big chamber called the thyroid cartilage. And the tip of it, you can see, it was Adam's apples, Adam, the Adam's apple in male right there. Well, it's the laryngeal prominence, that's the anatomy of it. Females have it too, it's just not called the Adam's apple. It's not as pronounced. That's why men have a deeper voice. The thyroid cartilage is more developed after puberty, so men have a deeper voice. Okay. So no. Prominence. Female bodybuilders 
always have a deep voice because they're using the androgen like hormones uh, for their workout. So I think that this cartilage has uh, the sex hormone receptors, so it thickens and broadens to make voices deeper. All right, so there's that thyroid cartilage. And right below it is this ring-shaped cricoid cartilage. Cricoid means like ring-shaped, so it looks like one of those class rings. So on the front is like the band of the class ring, and then that's the ring part. So now you have one cricoid cartilage. Here's a superior view of the larynx, and again, the posterior view, which we saw before. Posteriorly, we can see the cricoid right there, already noted it. We could see the thyroid. We could also see the epiglottis. I already wrote that down. You know, so no, that, that's what it looks like when the mucous membrane is removed. Um, if you look at a superior view, we can see, well, I'm sorry, you can see both posteriorly and superiorly. These pyramid shaped, these pitcher shaped arytenoid cartilages. So they're paired. Right, they're paired, you have, you have two of them. Now these cartilages, um, not only are they paired, they pivot, they can move. And that's what the picture on the right is trying to indicate to you. They can pivot. Because they're attached to the vocal cords. Vocal cords attached here. And since I got thyroid cartilage here, you can see on the superior view, the vocal ligament, which is the vocal cord, so you can call it vocal cord or ligament. I'll put ligament down here in parentheses. They run anteriorly attached to the inside of the thyroid cartilage. Vocal cords attach here too. <coughs> So on the superior view, the vocal cords run anteriorly from and, uh, the arytenoid cartilages. They both run up and attach to the inside of the thyroid cartilage. It's not labeled, but the space between them is called the glottis. Space between. Vocal cords. And this space is really important. This is the space that can get blocked when you choke. So it's, it leads right down to the trachea, the main airway. Okay, that's a space you always want to keep open. Okay. Uh, Alright, so let's see. The other little cartilages that you can see there are little horns on the tips of the arytenoids. Okay, and horn shaped is the word anatomy word for this corniculate. So the corniculate cartilages are paired horn shaped cartilages at the very tip of the arytenoid.
If I go back a few slides, the picture of a model. I called them corniculate tubercles before, because when you put the membrane over it, it makes a bump right there. So that's the corniculate tubercle, one and the same. Basically, when the membrane is over it, right there, it looks like a bump, and you call it the corniculate tubercle. For example, right there, where there's the number three, if you could actually see the cartilage, call it corniculate cartilage. If you can't see it, just call it tubercle. Either way, it's cornicular, right? Number four would be arytenoid. Okay. Now, there's another tubercle here. That bump, that bump, that was the cuneiform tubercle. It's not that bump that we're talking about. This is the corniculate, that's the cuneiform. Um, so, we already noted that other bump. So, let's move on. So, I was right here. Let's look at this next slide. This is a um, a sagittal section through the larynx, and I oriented it just like it's oriented in the neck, so you can kind of see. So let's go through what we already know. This big shield-shaped thing is thyroid. This ring-shaped thing is cricoid. You see um, a retinoid right there, which means pitcher shape. I never thought it looked like a pitcher, like lemonade or something. I suddenly thought it looked like that. The little horn is corniculate, and we can see two ligaments here. The bottom one is your vocal cord. The top one has no function in voice production. So it's called um, the false vocal cord. Sometimes I call it the vocal ligament. But because it's the one that functions in voice production, they call it the true vocal cord. True. True vocal cord. Now, when you put membrane over it, it looks like a pair of lips. Two ligaments, but there are ligaments inside there. So the bottom lip, so to speak, is the true vocal cord. But because it's got the membrane over it, sometimes this is called the true vocal fold. A fold is like membrane with something in it. So, or true vocal fold. So I gave you three different names for the same thing. You can call it any of it. I really don't care. Just remember which one it is, top or bottom. 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 The top one does not participate in voice production. Okay, anyways, that ligament is the vestibular ligament. So it's the false vocal cord or vestibular, um, vestibular fold. So any of those are fine. It's all the same thing to me. They look like lips when you put the membrane over it. So definitely you should be able to tell larynx, whether it's in a half head model or just the larynx by itself, all the laryngeal cartilages that are seen. Students commonly miss this one. For example, there's the cricoid. Can you see it in the neck here? What if I point to that? Identify. You know, that, that's cricoid there. It's, it's hard to see. It's not really showing well. It's cricoid, cricoid. There's thyroid. So get used to seeing it in the neck and out of the neck. That's why I put these slides together. Move on. Two. This picture here, where it's just show, showing you the, a close-up of the view we just saw. Okay, just remember, top one is false. It's the vestibular ligament, the false vocal cords.
true vocal cord. Okay, here's a view of the arytenoid and corniculate isolated. Arytenoid, corniculate, all by itself. There it is in the full larynx model. Here's a, again, we looked at the superior view before. This is kind of the view of a doctor if you're looking through a, a laryngoscope. Okay, so we see the root of the tongue here is epiglottis. The whitish color are the true vocal cords. So do you see how there's this like little bit of tissue above it? That's going to be false. Okay. Uh, so what I did was I took a picture of inside the tongue larynx model because this view can be seen in the model we have in the classroom. So you're looking for that V, upside down V. If I have you identify those white structures, what are you going to put? Any of these three, vocal ligaments, your vocal cords, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, again, what's the space between the vocal cords? The glottis. You know, a lot of times, um, I, well, every time I do the anatomy lab for the paramedic students, they practice intubating on cadavers. And um, what they do is, when they put the, the curved blade in, I forget what it's called, they're trying to get the tongue out of the way. They're trying to lift it up. The patient's lying down with their head facing up. They're standing behind them. They put the blade in. They, they lift up a little bit. Okay. Um, and there's teeth, and you don't want to chip the teeth. So they're very careful when they put that blade in. They're supposed to lift up. They're not supposed to tilt it. Because when they tilt it, that's when you crack molars. Okay. So they always say, it's like when you say cheers to someone. So you don't spill your drink, you don't tilt your glass. Say cheer, you just kind of go like that. That's how they train them to lift it up, to get all this out of the way. And this is what they're looking for. They're trying to see that. Once they see that, they, they know where to put the air tube, right? Uh, that's how you innovate. And of course, they have to, the test is, you want to go down the airway, not the food way. So we have it all dissected open so you can see everything. And if they inflate the stomach, well, you know they missed. Okay. Uh, so this is an important part for innovation. There's the glottis closed. So you can see that the false vocal cord is this area right above it, right there. And the true vocal cord is below it, right there. Glottis in between. Um, there, there's a picture. This is that same model that you can take apart. I like this picture here. If I point to that, is that true or false? That's the truth. There's the false. It helps guard the airway. I mean, do you see kind of how it's above it? It's like a little shelf above the airway. I'm sure if food got there, like you'd kind of cough it out before it had a chance to go down. Okay. Of course, food can get trapped. Uh, if food does block the airway, the person is making no sound. It's very scary. If, if they can make any coughing sound, just let them cough it out. They'll probably cough it out. I remember I was at yeah, a Mexican restaurant, and this guy was like making this weird noise. He's going, <gasps> he could barely get air in, and he finally coughed out a shrimp. But he was this close to choking. Okay, I was like, what did you go over there? So, this is the thing that gets blocked. Now, the function of the vocal cords is like the sound of my voice, it's talking. Voice production, a little bit on that. Voice production is the intermittent release of exhale there. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. You don't talk when you breathe in, right? You only talk when you breathe out. And it's the opening and closing of the glottis. So when, the, uh, when basically the glottis is open, it rushes in. You're not talking then. Upon exhalation, uh, the vocal cords close and air is forced to whistle through the slit. It vibrates the cords, and that's producing the sound. Okay? And if you try talking while you breathe in, what does it sound like? <laughs> right? You can't, you can't do it. Now, I always try it every year, and it never works. You always talk when you breathe out. And the sound of your voice is determined by pitch. That's the length and tension of the vocal cords. Loud is just, you know, like screaming on a roller coaster, just the, just the strength at which air rushes across it. That's why you can get a hoarse voice after you're screaming because 
while you've been vibrating your vocal cords all day. And the, the other upper respiratory tract structures help shape, they, they resonate, amplify, enhance the sound quality, pharynx, nasal cavities. That's why you're congested, you sound high and whiny because those things are all closed up. You also use um, language by the shaping of your tongue, palate, and lips. Um, there's a whole field of speech pathology that can help, uh, especially young kids, um, speak correctly if there's any kind of neurological disorder. And there's a lot of musculature around the larynx. And I'm only going to give you two to study. There's a lot more muscles, but we're going to study two muscles of the larynx, one in the front and one in the back, just to give you an idea how the muscles help participate in the movement of vocal cords and talking and breathing. Anteriorly, the one on the front is the, the critical thyroid. There's a couple of heads to it. I'm not going to ask you to name the attachments because it's in the name for this muscle. What do you think crico refers to? You know, the cricoid cartilage. The thyroid refers to the thyroid cartilage. But um, well, the one on the back is the posterior cricoarytenoid. are all, the laryngeal nerves are all branches of vagus. So you know the innervation. Superior laryn laryngeal nerve. this picture in here because I want you to see that the anatomy of these laryngeal nerves is they're recurrent. They kind of travel inferiorly and then the one on the right it kind of loops around the subclavian artery. The one over here on the left it loops underneath the aortic arch and um, an important clinical side note is if you have an aortic aneurysm in this area which is a weakness of the artery wall it dilates and it bulges and it compresses the laryngeal nerve and so the patient might present with a hoarse voice. So that might be a clue of an aneurysm, which is an emergency that you need to report and may save the person's life. So again, hoarse voice may indicate an aortic aneurysm. Uh, all right, well anyways, the function of critical thyroid, we have a, a functional larynx, it's over there. So this is a picture of that larynx there. They put a screw there because it pivots. Okay, if I pull on this, it pivots. That's the action of that muscle. It, it contracts and it pulls it forward and it tenses and relaxes the vocal cords as it contracts and relaxes. That's, that's the action of this muscle. Tense, relax, vocal cords. The posterior cricoretinoid is um, innervated by the inferior laryngeal nerve. The inferior laryngeal nerve, again, a branch of vagus, a branch of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, this, I, I chose this muscle, it's pretty important. It helps pivot the arytenoids. So what I'm doing here, that, that's me kind of showing you. It's a functional larynx because when you pull on that, it simulates the action of posterior cricoarytenoid. 
and it pivots the arytenoids in a way that abducts the local cords. That allows you to breathe in. So paralysis of this muscle, you may have trouble breathing. I believe that's the only muscle that can abduct the local cords. have in the room that shows both of the nerves on the tongue larynx model and it indicated here. So uh, you're responsible to look for that. So since we have uh, the glottis and the larynx, uh, you should know the basalva's mute, which is straining against the closed glottis. strain against a closed glottis, what you're doing is you're trapping air in the respiratory tract and it helps splint and stabilize your trunk. Like when lifting, it's like the grunting while lifting a heavy object, right? Increase the intra-abdominal pressure when the ab muscles contract. Like for example, when you empty the rectum, right? When you go number two, you're kind of instinctively doing it. When you lift heavy loads, like I said, um, it increases blood flow to the head when you kind of strain, kind of uh, forceful effort. They actually trained uh, fighter pilots to do this um, while they're flying. The g-forces are so hard on the human body. Um, Sometimes the heart has trouble pumping blood to the head when you're flying a jet because of the G-forces. And so they train fighter pilots to develop the musculature in the neck area and also to do this maneuver while you're uh, flying a jet so you don't pass out. Uh, but that's a problem. You know, you're flying a jet and you black out. So um, it has its importance. It also can be used to equalize middle air pressure when you're driving up to elevation and the ears pop kind of a thing. <clears throat> All right, so anyways, um, we're kind of done with larynx. Any questions on larynx before we do the airway the trachea? Yeah? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Now the trachea, what's shown there, it extends from okay, this is your main windpipe. It's your main airway. It's the main airway. So far, what we've been talking about <clears throat> just to kind of backtrack a little bit. Nasal cavities, pharynx, larynx, trachea,
bronchi, and even some bronchioles. All they do is they conduct air. There's no gas exchange in these larger structures. You're just trying to deliver the fresh air. And so, all the way up to these bronchioles called terminal bronchioles, they call it the conducting airways or the conducting zone. sometimes conducting zone. You're just conducting the air, but there's no gas exchange. Now the main function is gas exchange, so it's the job of all these structures that I'm going through so far in that trachea. It's just to deliver fresh air, okay? But no gas exchange occurs. Deliver fresh air, but there's, again, no gas exchange. So let me go through the details of the trachea. I think you have to know. Uh, It begins inferior to the larynx. That's at about the level of C6 vertebra. It extends inferiorly. About C6. Down to around the level of around T4 or T5 vertebra. If you look at the picture, it's right by your sternal angle. That's the angle between manubrium and body of the sternum. It's not very long, actually. I mean, I can feel my Adam's apple. So I know right below that's the cricoid. And right below that is probably where my trachea begins in my neck. And I can feel my manubrium. So it's like from here to here. It's about four inches. The trachea is only about four inches. About four inches in length. From there to there. And well, um, it's the largest airway. You only got one. And it's about two and a half inches, I'm sorry, two and a half in centimeters in diameter. 2.5 centimeters that's a diameter that can basically accommodate the width of one finger about okay. unless you have really fat fingers or something but about that's about what we're talking about here one airway four inches long and that's it that's the that's the, the one thing that's going to ventilate all the lung tissue Um, if we look at a cross-sectional view, we can see the, the relational um, aspects of it. Basically, it's in front of the esophagus. The esophagus is posterior to the trachea. Those four inches, you start in your neck and you go down to the top of your chest. And um, <clears throat> well, we can see that there's many cartilaginous rings. Okay, this thing is kind of um, well, it's kind of hard to tell from this picture. We'll look at better pictures. Note the cartilaginous rings; see, they're C-shaped. Okay, 
means many C-shaped cartilaginous rings. Again, the cartilage is a hyaline cartilage. And it helps keep the airway patent. The reason for being C-shaped and not complete, a complete circle is that you want the, the back to be soft. So there's soft tissue in the back. There's a tracheolus muscle. You don't have to know that, but that helps to accommodate uh, the food that you swallow. Um, it, it gives a little as you swallow and the food passes down behind the trachea. The tissue is soft and not hard like the hyaline cartilage. And also from this figure, we see that the tracheal wall is very thick to conduct the air. And there are three layers. There's a mucosa, submucosa, and the adventitia. So if we study this picture, but look at a real tracheal wall, this is what we see under a low magnification. So under a low magnification, the innermost lining is the mucosa, and it touches the air that's, that you're conducting. It's right here. This top layer is the mucosa. So from here to here is the submucosa. And from here all the way down is the adventitia, the outermost layer of the tracheal wall. Here's a closer up view. Once again, and then are there. Mucosa, submucosa, all the rest is adventitia. So here's an even closer up view, 400x. There's a good view of the mucosa. What I want you to know is this epithelium. It's uh, ciliated. Uh, pseudostratified, it looks like there's many layers, but it's only one layer. Ciliated, pseudostratified, columnar, ET, with goblin cells. Okay, so let's write that down. And also there's this connective tissue basement membrane, it's called a lamina propria. That constitutes the, the mucosa of the trachea. Under that, it's ciliated. Pseudostratified columnar ET with goblet cells. And again, the connective tissue basement membrane is a lamina propria. submucosa from you can see it all here and the main structure there it's a loose connective tissue with all of this there's a lot of glands in there these are seromucous glands so the goblet cells along with the seromucous gland will um, provide a, a thick mucus layer okay which helps catch debris of the fresh air you're breathing <clears throat> connective tissue, loose CT, and note the seromucous glands. They'll, they'll help keep the, the airway moist. Okay, it traps debris. Now all of those mucous glands have a duct that leads to the surface, but you usually never see that. They look like they're just trapped down here, but they all have a duct that leads to the surface, like right here. That's like a duct leading to the surface where it kind of imaginates in. So this slide I kind of got excited about. That's what we do. If you're a nerd like me, you get excited when you see it like this. You see the duct, but it's, you can see the gland leading to the, uh, with its duct leading to the surface. It's hard to see because you've got to cut the gland in the exact plane in the tissue of where the duct is, and it's very thin. 
So this one, they happen to do that. So here are the, the mucus secreting cells, and all the mucus will be secreted onto the surface that is already ciliated. So in combination with the mucus and the cilia, you have what's called a mucus escalator. So here's a closer picture of inside of a mucus gland. The mucus escalator is like a productive cough. You always catch the debris and you move it up and out. Okay? So it's not random movement of the cilia. The cilia will always move the debris up and out. That's why it's called it an escalator. You know, in the mall, the escalator goes up and down. This escalator only goes up. So you can always have a productive cough. So uh, I don't know what to write. Just, just write. Know the mucus escalator function. Largely because of the dense cilia. Uh, those pictures don't really do it justice. You can kind of Google and look at videos of mucus escalator. It's very organized and it's very effective. Um, cigarette smoke kills the cilia. And so you lose the mucus escalator function. So a smoker's cough is called a smoker's cough because they don't have that function. And so their cough is not very pr productive. If you're able to quit smoking, epithelial tissue is highly regenerative. So you should get it back if you can quit. Of course, that's easier said than done. All right, so that's trachea. So when you get to the trachea, and then you start doing all these divisions. We have to go through what's called the bronchial tree. So the trachea ends at the last tracheal cartilage. That last cart uh, cartilage ring is called the carina. And um, it marks the beginning of the right and left bronchi. So let me show you this picture there. And um, what we're going to see is that by the time air reaches the bronchi, it's gone through all those structures we've talked about thus far. Air is warmed and cleansed with impurities. It's saturated with water vapor. And they just subdivide. I'm going to go through all these 23 orders of branchings. And here's a picture of the larynx with the trachea with some of the bronchi down here. So again, the trachea ends. It starts here, inferior to the cricoid. Okay. And um, oh, by the way, if you can't intubate through the glottis, you can kind of go in through this ligament here between uh, the thyroid and the cricoid right there. That's another way you can make an incision and get to the airway uh, inferior to, to the glottis. But anyways, here's trachea, all these rings, count them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. The last ring, it looks like underpants, is called carina, and it marks the, the division of trachea into the right and left main bronchus. Oh, man, you know what? I forgot something. Let me backtrack. I didn't teach Adventitia. So write down Adventitia. This big structure here reminds me of a big pumpkin. Uh, well, it's highly cartilage. And it's, it's what the cartilage ring looks like if you chop it and look at it in cross-section. Okay. So write down Adventitia. The main thing I want you to know is that's where the hyaline cartilage is for the cartilage rings. Adventitia. Hyaline cartilage. Tree. One thing, one last thing to note about trachea, all this stuff. 
is Shrink your ends at its last tracheal ring called Carina. There it divides. Okay. And so um, the airways are um, understood by their divisions. It's really an upside down tree. Imagine the tracheal larynx is the trunk. Let's turn it upside down. It looks more like a tree. But the point is, it branches out. Okay. Bronchial tree. The airway, you refer to the airways in terms of the division number. Refer to airways. By the division number. divides, you're at division zero. The trachea is the airway before it divides. So you just call it division zero, that's the trachea. The first division, which occurs at the carina, um, generates two airways the right and the left main bronchus. So at the first division, division one, you get right main bronchus, left main bronchus, one airway becomes two at the first division. Because it's the first division, sometimes these are called the primary bronchi. Bronchus is singular, bronchi is plural. Again, in these first large conducting airways, a lot of cartilage. That's the main structural feature of the airways. Have lots of cartilage to keep them open. Okay. And remember, the trachea is the largest airway, about two and a half centimeters in diameter. But as we branch out, as you can see from the picture, the airways do get smaller, but there's more of them. Um, so again, these first airways, okay, well, let's just keep going. So that's what I have here. First division in red, I'm just pointing to right and left main bronchus. There is anatomical differences here. Um, the aortic arch, it kind of goes over the left one. So it kind of like makes it kind of go more horizontal a little bit. The right one is kind of more vertical and in line with the trachea. So this one. So usually what, book, what, most, um, what most clinical books say is, say a child, um, a, a small coffee bean or a peanut gets stuck in the airway and it goes rattles down the trachea. It's more likely to get lodged in the right bronchus than the, uh, the left main bronchus because the right one's more in line with the trachea. Okay. So the right one is uh, more prone to blockage. Concern for parents, like a two-year-old, three-year-old, they're at that age where they stick everything in their mouth. It's something you want to look out for. Okay, that's the first division, two airways. There's the carina. I call it the underpants. Okay, that's kind of what it looks like. Uh, the two airways coming out of it. The last tracheal ring, carina. The second 
division gives rise to five airways. So division two. The second division gives rise to five lobar bronchi. You're going to have three on the right, two on the left. So a total of five. Each of those airways, well, I should have mentioned this from the get-go, going back to division one, each right and left main bronchus, they're delivering fresh air to the right lung and the left lung. Okay, I should have said that, but you might want to note it in. Uh, each delivers air to right, left, lungs. Can't assume to go that, so I gotta say you do have right and left lungs. So therefore, the trend is as the airways divide. Each of these five lobar bronchi are delivering fresh air to a lobe of the lung. Each deliver air to a lobe of the lung. That's why they're called lobar bronchi because it's the second division, you're also allowed to name them secondary bronchi. Based on this information, how many lobes are on the right lung? Three, and two on the left. The, the left lung, we say, has one less low because it has to make more room for the heart, so that's kind of how I think of it. So anyways, the second division, five airways. The third division, you got like 19 or 20, depending on which book you read. So you know, you want to go with 19, that's what I got there. But you're getting more with each division. Third division gives rise to something like 19 or 20. Call them um, segmental bronchi. So we're only on the third division. Look how many you have. Uh, we started off with one airway. The diameter was large, I mean, two and a half centimeters. By the time we get down to here, maybe the diameter is something like uh, 0.5, um, 5 millimeters, something like that. They're much smaller, but you can still see it with your naked eye. Okay. Because this is the third division, um, you can also call them tertiary bronchi. down to here, you still have lots of cartilage. However, they're not cartilage rings, they're more like cartilage plates. I'll put that as a note. Still have lots of cartilage at the third division. Also, um, you have 19 of them. What's happening is each of these 19 or 20 airways is delivering fresh air to a segment of the lobe. That's why they're called segmental bronchi. Deliver air to a segment of a lobe. And the next slide I put what's called the bronchopulmonary segments. Okay, so know that.
I've heard that um, in, if you have to remove part of the lung tissue, say due to cancer or something, you can use this anatomy as a guide to properly remove part of the lung. You want to remove it per segment because you get the lung tissue with the cancer, you hope, along with the airway and all the blood supply, nerve supply, they all come packaged together in these segments. Yeah. And so the color code shows you the different segments of a lobe. And you're not responsible to know all the bronchopulmonary segments. Just kind of know the idea of it. It has to do with the third division, okay? The segmental bronchi. Got about 19 or 20 of them. They're labeled with Roman numerals here. Again, you, you, you don't have to know, like, this one is number 10. Okay, just know that, well, if they're colored like this, call it a tertiary bronchi or segmental bronchus. You'll get it right. Bet you if you go into the respiratory program, you got to know them all. Uh, okay, the bronchial tree, continuing to the respiratory zone, um, this is going to continue on. There's like 24, 23 orders of branching, and we only got to the third one. So let's kind of like be brief. The third division continues on, let's say, all the way 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, to the 10th division. They're still considered bronchi. So this slide here, there's a lot of pictures like this on models and in your book. What they do is they prune it for you, because otherwise it's too busy to look at. And at each division, they prune it off so you can see by the time you get down to the 24th division, you're at the dead end. So up here, label number one, you can see the cartilage is still there. It's becoming progressively less and less and less. Those are all considered bronchi, okay? Bronchus, I should say. So from three to 10, it's pretty much, call it sub-segmental bronchi. And I'm not gonna put how many. They're kind of too many to, to number now. Uh, just call them sub say, metal bronchi. You still have cartilage. So at around the 10th to the 11th division, that's when you kind of switch from bronchi to bronchiole, number two on this figure starts right there, these tiny airways. The smallest bronchi, which have some cartilage, maybe you're talking one millimeter in diameter. They're really small. They, you start to get microscopic um, after this point. The bronchioles, there's no cartilage. They're cartilage free. And there's, you start to see increasing amounts of smooth muscle. Also, you're going to start to see more and more elastic tissue in the lung. But no cartilage is the thing. You get to uh, the bronchiole level. And there's many branchings of the bronchiole. On this figure, they started at number two. But there's many branchings here. Okay. And you go from about 11 to about 16. But I want to continue on the top here. They're all bronchioles. They get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, at 16, you get what's called the terminal bronchiole. It's not the last bronchiole. It's just, well, let me explain it. 
at the 16th branching of the terminal bronchioles. That is the end of the conducting airways, the end of the conducting zone. After that is the start of the respiratory, respir respiratory zone. So this is the end of the conducting zone. After this point, you'll actually have gas exchange. The structure needed for gas exchange is the alveolus. And the bronchioles, after the 16th division, they start to have it. So number five on this figure, right around here, where is it, number five? Yeah, I think it's number five. Well, let me go to this one. Here's a picture from the book. We have this on one of our models, so I want you to study both. Now, this picture here, is, is basically the dead end. So to go back to the previous picture here. This in the box is blown up on the next slide. So we kind of end it right here. Terminal bronchioles. After terminal bronchioles, you'll start to have alveoli that stud the bronchioles. So after 16, end of the conducting zone, this is the start of respiratory zone. So, division 17, 18, 19, you have what's, what are called uh, the respiratory bronchioles. They're bronchioles with alveoli. respiratory zone because this is where you can have gas exchange. Divisions number 20, 21, and 22 are called alveolar ducts. Last division, 23 or 24, depending on what book you read. I'll say 23, we'll just end it there. That's where you get the dead end alveoli. On the picture there, it kind of looks like clusters of grapes. It's kind of what I've uh, reminded me of. And uh, they call number seven the asinus, which describes the shape. To me, it looks like many clusters of grapes. Number eight, alveolar sac, is like one cluster of grapes. If you cut one open, you can see that's an alveolar duct. And the alveolar duct leads to the dead end. Each individual grape is an alveolus. Okay, so once again, number seven, other structures to note here. We'll get to this part, asinus. It's like Many alveolar sacs, okay? Um, many alveolar sacs. So an, al an alveolar sac is like one cluster of grapes, but it has many grapes, it has many alveoli. I'll say it has many alveolar ducts leading to alveoli. Imagine a, a long hallway. And along the hallway are all these chambers, these rooms on either side of the hallway. But instead of doors that open and close, there are these sliding doors. 
to open into the chambers on the side of the hallway. So that analogy is usually given for the alveolar duct, okay? And then the chambers are like the individual alveoli, okay? So if I point to an individual little grape here, I'm going for alveolus. If I point to something leading into many of them, it's alveolar duct. The whole thing is a sac. Let's kind of keep the term straight. But the key is gas exchange. If you look at this figure, look for the elastic fibers and the smooth muscle, because they're both illustrated. Let me see if I can turn off the lines and point to it. You already have it in your notes that you wrote it down. There's more smooth muscle and elastic fibers. There's no cartilage. The elastic fibers are the small dark bands that wrap like rubber bands around all the alveolar spaces where gas exchange occurs. And all the more reddish, larger structures of the bronchioles is the smooth muscle that can constrict due to autonomic um, innervation. So when you get to the dead end, the whole point is gas exchange. So if you look at this structure with the pulmonary circulation, uh, you see this figure. Well, we already talked about it. So when you get to this picture, you get to the lung tissue, you have to know the branch of pulmonary artery, branch of pulmonary vein. Does the pulmonary artery carry oxygenated or deoxygenated blood? Let's see if you remember that. D, oxygenated. Remember, this is the right heart pumping blood through the pulmonary trunk. The deoxygenated blood goes to the lungs because you want to pick up oxygen. So the branch of the pulmonary artery on this figure, the branch, it always is on the airway. It follows the airway. Okay. It's colored blue on this figure because it carries the oxygenated blood, so I like that. Here is branch of pulmonary artery, and even say deoxygenated blood in parentheses to help students remember. Right there. Okay, the blue structure, it's kind of following the airway there, okay, and it's delivering the oxygen poor blood to the alveolar space. And then there's a branch of um, pul sorry, branch of pulmonary vein as the blood picks up oxygen based on diffusion, kind of all leads into the branch of the pulmonary vein. Notice how the branch of the pulmonary vein, they're kind of, they're off the airway. They're kind of on the sides between the fibrous septum and the pulmonary lobules. So deoxygenated blood for the, the branch of the pulmonary artery. branch of pulmonary vein carries oxygenated blood. So remember that's oxygenated blood, I'll use red. They're kind of like, these branches are in between the fibrous septum, they're kind of off the airway, in between. Fibrous septum. So it's like I usually see 
you know, the arteries are delivering blood, but then the veins, they kind of like collect on the bottom there and they kind of go up the sides. So if you look at models and stuff, you gotta look for these clues because the colors aren't always gonna help you. Uh, so we're looking at a model here that expects students to know. If you see cartilage, is it bronchi or bronchiole? Bronchi. If you see no cartilage, bronchiole. I see a lot of skin muscle. I even see some elastic tissue. I look at the little grapes are alveoli. I, if I see like the yellow rubber bands, that's elastic tissue. These are what the pulmonary capillaries look like. This is not part of pulmonary circulation. This is a bronchial artery, which just supplies, um, it just supplies oxygenated blood to all the lung structures. It's not a part of pulmonary circulation. So let's note that. You need to know bronchial artery. Uh, part of pulmonary circulation. So I'll put it not under pulmonary circulation. Bronchial artery. Supplies O2 rich blood to airways. Lung. Pulmonary circulation is to pick up oxygenated blood to pump the rest of the body. Okay. All right, the pulmonary circulation on this model are, is shown, and it can get a little confusing because they mix the colors up. The pulmonary, the branch of the pulmonary artery um, is this one, but they color it red. But it carries deoxygenated blood, that's the confusing thing. So you just have to remember that. And always remember the rule I gave you. The pulmonary artery, it follows the airway. So do you see how, how it branches and that branch follows the airway? That's how you tell branch of pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood. This is the pulmonary vein carrying oxygenated blood, however they color it blue. Okay. You see how this branch it crisscrosses with the airway, so I know it's not the artery. And look here how it's on the bottom, and it goes up the side. Uh, that's just like the previous figure, how the pulmonary veins, they're at the bottom, and they go up the side in the septum. It's the same thing there. So um, other things to identify, uh, basically you got uh, alveolar sac here cut open so you can see something when we move on. And so uh, when we get down to the dead end, we have this figure here. So what we did, we start with zero, we went through all the divisions. This goes up to 24. The diameter of the airway gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Alveoli may be uh, 0.3 millimeters, but you have a lot of them. That's, that's a big number, which presents a lot of um, a cross-sectional area. Okay. Over a million square centimeters of area for gas exchange.